I want to quickly recap last week because we spent time last week teaching on intentional love. That was the theme of the message, intentional love. And we looked at the book of Luke in chapter 10 where Jesus was confronted by one of the religious leaders who typically would try to trap him into like these questions and try to get him to stumble on his words. And then he, he asked Jesus, he was like, hey, you know, what does the law, like, like, teacher, what should I do to inherit eternal life? And then Jesus is like, what does the law of Moses say? And he's like, well, you know, love your neighbor, and no, love, love your Lord, your God, with all your heart, your soul, your strength, and all your mind, and love your neighbor as yourself. And so as we um, went through that, we talked about how loving God, the word love means actively doing what God prefers. So we looked at what it means to love the Lord God with all your heart is how do I actively do what the Lord prefers concerning my heart? And that heart represents your inner man. It represents your desires. Then we talked about what it means to love him with all of your soul. That's your unique identity. And it also takes into account the eternal elements of, of what happens when we transition from this life to eternity. Then we talked about loving God with all of your strength. And, and that word strength, when you break it down into the Greek, speaks to the force required to overcome immediate resistance. And we talked about how anytime you do something to honor God, anything, anytime you do something to pursue or prioritize God, you will be met with an immediate resistance. Amen? This morning, that immediate resistance was a 20-degree weather chill. So the fact that you've made it past that immediate resistance to be in the house of the Lord, that's a reason to celebrate in and of itself. Amen? Because it is cold. Um, there's going to be immediate resistance when you go to pray. There's going to be immediate resistance when you go to worship. There's going to be immediate resistance when you go to read your Bible, which is why sometimes it's, it's hard to even get through a couple of verses without dozing off. That's spiritual warfare. And so we talked about that. And then we talked about how loving God with all of our minds means aligning my thoughts, my frame of, of reference, my worldview, and my, my perspective with that of Jesus. And so we spent the majority, the entire time last week just talking about that first instruction, love Lord, love the Lord your God with all your heart, mind, soul, and your strength, right? But it was a threefold instruction. He said, love the Lord your God, essentially with everything that you have. And then it says, love your neighbor as you love yourself. So the instruction is to love God, love your neighbor, and to love yourself. And as we navigate life, intentional love is a commandment. It is the greatest commandment. And so this is one thing that we have to get right if we're going to ultimately fulfill the promises of God. Amen? So today I want us to dive deeper into the other two instructions as it relates to loving others and loving yourself. And I want to continue on in that same passage, which is in Luke chapter 10. And I'm just going to start in 25 and go all the way through until the Holy Spirit says, stop reading. Amen. Because we love the Bible in here. So, and I'm reading from the New Living Translation. Chapter 25 begins with, uh, says, one day an expert in religious law stood up to test Jesus by asking him this question. Teacher, what should I do to inherit eternal life? Jesus replied, what does the law of Moses say? I think it's always cool how Jesus would respond with questions. Right. And I take notes from him, him all the time because people will try to challenge you and test you, you know, and, and, and the, the sinful nature, the flesh of you wants to clap back. But I challenge you to just pause and ask questions. This is what Jesus did. So we're, we're here to follow Jesus. So he said, what does the law of Moses say? How do you read it? The man answered, you must love the Lord your God with all your your heart, all your soul, all your strength and all your mind and love your neighbor as yourself. Verse 28, right, Jesus told him, do this and you will live. Verse 29, the man wanted to justify his actions, so he asked Jesus, and who is my neighbor? Jesus replied with a story. It's another thing he did. He would reply with stories and parables and, and yeah, like, let me just go before I get excited. So he said, he, he, he replied with a, a story. 
And he said, a Jewish man was traveling from Jerusalem down to Jericho, and he was attacked by bandits. They stripped him of his clothes, beat him, and left him half dead beside the road. By chance, a priest came along. But when he saw the man lying there, he crossed to the other side of the road and passed him by. Verse 32, a temple assistant, also known as a Levite, walked over and looked at him lying there. But he also passed by on the other side. Then a despised Samaritan came along. And when he saw the man, he felt compassion for him. Going over to him, the Samaritan soothed his wounds with olive oil and wine and bandaged them. Then he put, to the, he, he put the man on his own donkey and took him to an inn where he took care of him. The next day, he handed the innkeeper two silver coins telling him, take care of this man. If his bill runs higher than this, I'll pay you the next time I'm here. Verse 36, now which of these three would you say was a neighbor to the man who was attacked by bandits? Jesus asked. The man replied, the one who showed him mercy. Then Jesus said, yes, now go and do the same. Heavenly Father, we thank you for your word. We thank you that it is a lamp unto our feet, that it is a light unto our path. And today I pray that you just illuminate something to us, Lord God, to every person under the sound of my voice, which shows them exactly where they are and exactly the path that you have for them. So Lord, have your way in this time. I thank you that your anointing is what breaks the yoke. So Father, I pray that you magnify yourself, diminish me so that your perfect will be done. And we consider it done right now in the mighty name of Jesus we pray, amen. Intentional love, part two. So I, I, again, I say I love Jesus in his strategic setup and how he responds to people. And first, he responds with questions. Then when he's further pressed, he goes into a story. And he's very captivating and very engaging. And he has his audience following along with, with his teaching. And he's doing it in a way where it resonates with them in the moment. So he's factoring in the context of the conversation, and he's factoring in who he's dealing with, and he's connecting the dots to make this make sense. This is my desire as a preacher. How do I bring this message to a place where it resonates with the audience contextually, it's accurate, and it actually brings about change? So Jesus is the perfect person to, to mirror and to emulate as he, as he does this. And the first thing I want to point out about this parable is the fact that he chose the road from Jerusalem to Jericho as a part of the parable. The road from Jerusalem to Jericho was known to be a very dangerous path. Just from the, the terrain and the winding roads and, and how it was conducive to getting got. If somebody wanted to get you, they knew if, they, if you were traveling on the road to Jericho, there are a lot of little nooks and crannies for you to hide, in, hide out into if you want to attack someone. And so Dr. King, who we celebrated this month, also referenced the road from Jerusalem to Jericho in his speech, I've Been to the Mountaintop. And he talked about how him and his wife Coretta were, had rented a car. They had went to Jerusalem and rented a car and we're driving from Jerusalem to Jericho. And this is what he said. He said, he was talking to his wife and he said, I can see why Jesus used this as the setting for this parable. It's a winding, meandering road. It's really conducive for ambushing. You start out in Jerusalem, which is about 1,200 feet above sea level. And by the time you get down to Jericho, 15 or 20 minutes later, you're about 2,200 feet below sea level. That's a dangerous road. This is what Dr. King said in reference to him driving it. So imagine a man walking it, right? So Jesus uses this path from Jerusalem to Jericho as the journey that this man is taking because it is a dangerous road. 
First off, before I even get, get into that, I want to just thank God for having delivered me from walking down some dangerous roads. Some of us have taken journeys down some dangerous roads, not knowing what was there to potentially attack us, what was there to potentially steal from our joy, from our peace. But we've taken these journeys down dangerous roads, and I just thank God that his grace was sufficient enough to protect us and to save us and to get us to where we are now. Amen? And so the first thing he did is he, he, he talked about the road from Jerusalem to Jericho. And then he talked about how first the, he's, he's setting, it, setting it up to, to where we need to learn how to learn, love our neighbors. And he talks about how the first person that approaches the man is a priest. Now, back in those days, Jews were divided into three groups. There was the priests, which was the leader. There were the Levites, which assisted the priests. And then there were the Israelites, just the general population, right? So when we look at how Jesus is telling this story, he completely jars his audience because he starts off saying the priests came and offered no help. Then he says that the assistant or the Levite came and offered no help. The natural person that you would expect him to say next would have been an Israelite. He comes in and says, then a Samaritan came. That's like me saying, first Michael Jordan came, then LeBron James came, and then Michael Myers showed up. It's like, what? So, again, this is a strategy that Jesus is using to jar his audience, to keep them captivated, and to deliver his point. He's emphasizing how drastically different the love that this person is about to receive, how drastically different that source is from what's expected. And so, the Samaritan, here's why it's important to acknowledge the differences between Samaritans and, and Jews. They clashed on every level. They didn't agree on spirituality. They didn't agree on anything socially. They didn't agree on anything. They ultimately were, the Samaritans were looked down upon as less than. They were a mixed race of people, so they were seen as impure. Jesus was even called a Samaritan as a derogatory term in the text. He said, aren't you that Samaritan that's possessed by demons? So it was used as an insult. And we see it further when Jesus has an encounter with the woman at, a, at the well who is also Samaritan and how she kind of distanced herself and she's like, do you realize who you're talking to? I'm a Samaritan woman. We're not even supposed to be, right? So there's, a, 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 there's tension between the Samaritans and the Jews. But what Jesus is emphasizing is that true love transcends any tension. It transcends race. True love transcends socioeconomic barriers. True love transcends political parties. Hello? True love transcends religion. True love transcends denominations within the church. True love transcends anything. When Jesus died, the word tells us that he killed hostility and made us all one body. So true love, because God is love, transcends anything that would try to keep us divided. Amen? And so the, the, the Samaritan and the Jew tension was real. But intentional love was in, exemplified by the Samaritan. Not by the priest, who it would have been expected to come through. Not by the Levite, who it would have been expected to come through. But from the Samaritan, the despised Samaritan. Let's revisit verse 33. It says, then a despised Samaritan came along, and when he saw the man, first off, he felt compassion. If you see people in need, if you see people hurting, if you see people suffering, if you see people oppressed, and you do not feel compassion, that is an opportunity to surrender your heart to Christ. Because the characteristic of Christ is compassion. When he was in the early stages of his ministry and he saw the multitudes coming out to meet him, he saw them as sheep without a shepherd. And the first thing he felt was compassion, says he was moved with compassion. 
Then he told his followers, the harvest is plenty, but the laborers are few. There's a lot of opportunity for salvation for these people, but not a lot of people really out here trying to do the kingdom work. And as believers, as a leader in this ministry, my responsibility is to cultivate an environment and inspire and encourage you to be those ones that recognize the harvest and also recognize what God has placed in you to be impactful for his kingdom. So intentional love was exemplified by the Samaritan. He went above and beyond. He went over to him, soothed his wounds with olive oil and wine, bandaged them, put the man on his own donkey and took him to a hotel, took him to an inn. And he took care of him even more there. And after that, he had to leave, but he paid the man's wages. He gave him two silver coins and said, if this isn't enough, don't worry, I will take care of it the next time I see you. Then Jesus asked the man, which one of these would you say is his neighbor? <laughs> which one of these people would you consider your neighbor? It was the least expected one. It was the least expected one. And I feel very strongly that God is going to test your ability to love with the least expected people. He's going to test your ability to love by sending you people you don't like. He's going to test your ability to love by putting you in situations that typically you shouldn't even be communicating with this person. He's going to test your ability to love by putting you in environments where the social norm, the societal norm is not that you even be involved, but your ability to love, just like the Samaritan man, should transcend anything that society considers the standard. We're coming up on election season. We're coming up on a lot of people having a lot of opinions. We're coming up on the season where the trolls come out in the daytime, not even at night. We're coming up on a season where you are going to be tested openly. And your ability to love is going to be put to the test. And so this isn't something that we're doing for anyone else. We're not doing it to prove anything to anyone else. This is something that is a heart situation. And so remember, anytime you're put in a situation, especially with people that you don't like, God knows there's a lot of people I don't like. I love everybody. But I don't, I, he didn't call me to like everybody, amen? He called me to love them. And that is going to be put to the test in this season. But I love how the least expected person to show him mercy showed him mercy. Have you ever received mercy from an unexpected source? I got a story, because I was reminded as I was prepping for this message that I received mercy from a very unlikely source. It was about two years ago. And my wife and I, we were on the road from Atlanta to Charlotte, North Carolina. Now, on the road from Atlanta to Charlotte, you have to go through South Carolina. I didn't know this upon first moving to Atlanta three years ago, but driving from Atlanta to Charlotte and going through South Carolina, you find yourself on a dangerous road, specifically if you're a black person. As we're riding down the freeway, I look up and I see a Confederate flag flying across the freeway. Now, for those who aren't too familiar with what the Confederate flag represents, I won't go through the entire history of it, but ultimately, if you're black, that's a sign that you're not welcome. It's a representation of, of people that were fans of slavery. And so whenever you see that symbol, it's a symbol that, hey, you might want to just keep on driving, playboy. 
This ain't a place you want to stop and get gas. It's not a place you want to stop and eat. This ain't a place you want to stop and, and, and rest up. Keep it pushing. It's a dangerous road. So I'm doing what I do, and I'm driving, and I get a little foot heavy as I'm driving through these streets. And then I see blue lights. Now, mind you, in this period of time, there is tension between the black community, the white community, the police, and the civilians. There is Black Lives Matter, there is Blue Lives Matter. There's tension. This is the South. This is a place that is known to have been racist at times and still is in certain areas, right? And so I see these blue lights and all of these things go through my mind. Okay, I'm on a dangerous road. I'm in an environment where I might not be welcome. And now I am being asked to pull over by someone who might not have my best interests at heart. These are all things in my mind. Not living in fear, but just acknowledging the situation I'm in, right? So I pull over. My wife is asleep. Wake up. She's, huh, what? What happened? Right? It was a good sleep, too. Mouth was open. I'm like, we're getting pulled over. So I roll all the windows down, turn the car off, hands on the steering wheel, 10 and 2, making this man feel as comfortable as he needs to. He gets out, and he walks up beside my car. The man is not five feet tall. He's, even with his state trooper hat on, he's uh, maybe a strong 4'9". So now... I am finding myself dealing with a man who could have a Napoleon complex because there's tension racially, there's tension in his position, there's tension between my height and his height, there's tension in the area that I'm in, and here I am on the side of this dangerous road. This man walks up and says, why were you going so fast? I said, sir, honestly, it's because I didn't see you. I just want to be completely honest. I didn't see you. Had I saw you, I wouldn't have sped by as quickly as I did. Um, furthermore, this is about the time my wife and I need to use the restroom. So I saw that exit, and I just wanted to get there and, 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 and get out, right? In my mind, I'm thinking, best case scenario, I get a ticket. Worst case scenario, I get shot. This is in my mind, considering the context of the moment and the region and the times that we're in. And so I'm like, get the phone, start recording, do whatever we need to do, because sadly, these were realistic thoughts. In my mind, this is a dangerous road. He takes my license, goes back to the car, comes back and says, hey man, just stop driving so fast. I'm like, is that it? Thank you, sir. He was like, yeah, just have a good day. Stop driving so fast. At that moment, I had to reconsider how I thought about police. At that moment, I had, consider, had to reconsider how I thought about white people in South Carolina. At that point, I had to reconsider how I thought about people, even in a region that had a flag of hatred swinging over it. I had to reconsider how Everybody is not a monolith. This man had every right to give me a ticket, and I was going fast. Like, it was probably one of those tickets you could have, you know, they could justify taking you into custody. Maybe 85 and a 55 or, you know, something crazy, right? What was it? 90. Okay, my wife said it was 90. I can't confirm or deny, but that's what she said. But he showed me mercy. Now, if it had been a black cop, I would have expected it, right? If it had been someone that I could see that we had something in common, I, I, I would have expected it. This was the least likely person I expected to show me mercy. But in hindsight, I believe he was a believer. I believe he could see past the skin tone, and he could see past the differences, and he lived according to the standard of Jesus, which was love without barriers. So as we continue to do life and to walk out life, that is our assignment, is to love without barriers. When you have an opportunity to provide mercy to someone, taking the opportunity to do that, 
even if you are in a position of power. Choosing mercy over oppression. Choosing love over tension. Choosing peace over problematic behavior. Amen? So it came from an unlikely source, and God is going to test each of you to be that unlikely source for someone. He's going to give you an opportunity to be that unlikely source of mercy and love for someone. Amen? Now, the next thing I want to point out is the instruction of love your neighbor as you love yourself. It's very interesting that this text doesn't give you examples of how to love yourself. It goes into a lot of details of how to love God, all of your heart, all of your mind, all of your soul, all of your strength. It gives you a clear example, even a parable, as to how to love your neighbor. And that this Samaritan man, who was an unlikely source of peace and, and mercy, went out of his way and went above and beyond to make sure this man was not only healed, but that he had a place that he could rest and recover in. So it was an extreme act of, of love and mercy. So he gives us, gives us that example, but then he just says, love your neighbor as yourself. Okay, well, what does, how, how, how do I do that? And at first, I've heard this message taught from a perspective of you can't pour out from an empty cup. You have to take care of yourself first before you take care of others. Put on your oxygen mask, airplane analogy, right, before you put on the oxygen mask of somebody else next to you. And this is all true. But I don't believe that's what's being taught in this text. Because it goes beyond lo love for, for others in this context goes beyond anything that I could do for myself. Again, love in, in this text, when you break it down in the Greek, it means to, to actively do what God prefers. So if I'm actively doing what God prefers concerning myself, then I believe that by loving God with all of my heart, all of my soul, all of my mind, all of my strength, I believe that that is the best way that I can love myself. The best way that I can love myself is surrender everything that I am to God. The Bible backs it up because it says that if we love God with everything, that's how we inherit the kingdom. That's how we inherit eternal life. So that is the ultimate commandment. And when I think about giving him everything, heart, mind, soul, and strength, by doing that, I remain in fellowship with him. By actively giving God my everything, I am intentionally staying attached to him. Society's definition of self-love is self-focused. Let me go to the spa. Let me get that cream and the, the cucumbers on my eyes. Let me get the, 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 the spa treatment. Let me get the, the massage. Let me make sure that I'm doing everything I can. Let me prioritize just my well-being. So it's, it's, it's self-focused. But God's definition of love is God-focused. Love goes beyond what I can do for myself. The Bible even tells us in the, in the book of Timothy they warn against self-love. Paul warns Timothy. He says, uh, I won't, uh, this is uh, 2 Timothy ver uh, chapter 3. He says, in the last days, there will be very difficult times for people will love only themselves. So that tells us that loving only ourselves is not what God is speaking to in this scripture. Because loving only ourselves, when we ourselves apart from Christ are nothing. The Bible also tells us that apart from Christ, no one is good. No one is righteous. I am the vine. You are the branches. Apart from me, you can do nothing. And so self-love absent from God is warned against. Self-love in communion with God is what we're commanded to do. 
Because as I commune with God, as I fellowship with God, as I rely on God, as I give him my heart, my mind, my soul, my strength, and I'm actively pursuing him, I am now able to pull from resources that are beyond me. Now it makes sense that I can be that unlikely source of love and mercy because I no longer see this, this person. I no longer see this Republican or this Democrat or this black person or this white person. I no longer see them through my lens of prejudice. I see them through the eyes of Jesus. That's why I can respond in an unlikely manner. Because it is not me, it is not my resources. I'm leveraging resources that are heavenly. I can be generous beyond what I'm typically generous in because I'm not tapping into my own resources. I'm tapping into riches that have been stored in heaven that cannot be stolen, that moths cannot eat. I'm tapped into another dimension. And as we love from that place, God gives us everything that we need. He gives us everything that we need. And I just want you to just, just, just remember that. As we leave out of these doors today, there's going to be somebody that is going to piss you off. There's going to be somebody that is going to be put in a position where you're, you're going to be tested. But just know, within your carnal being, you do not have the capacity to love the way that God has commanded. We require the love of God. We require the resources of God to enable us to love in the way in which he commanded. Amen? Hallelujah. So love your neighbors. That's everybody. Even the people that you don't like. And that instruction just reminds you of how hard it is to be a follower of Jesus. He said, if any one of you wants to be my disciple, if any one of you wants to follow me, you must take up your cross and follow me. That means dying daily. Paul said that we are to present ourselves as a living sacrifice to God, and that is our reasonable service. So for me, Going back to what it means to love myself, it's me sacrificing myself as a reasonable, as a living sacrifice to God as my reasonable service. The best way you can love yourself is to love God with everything that you have. The best way you can love yourself is to be tapped in to the mind of Christ, to be tapped into his resources, to be tapped into his wisdom the best way you can love yourself, because everything else stems from that. Who you choose to do life with, when you're tapped in, you don't have to worry about, am I making the right decision? He's gonna let you know which opportunities are of you and which are not. He's gonna make sure you know, because man is getting very tricky and the enemy is very enticing and he'll put things in front of you that, that look good, taste good, feel good, but are not good according to God's promise for you. But when you're tapped in, you cannot be deceived, hallelujah. When you're tapped in, you cannot be deceived. When you're tapped in to, to, to Jesus and you're tapped in to God, because you've been surrendering your thoughts, you've been surrendering your heart, you've been surrendering your will, you've been surrendering your desires and, and actively pursuing what God prefers and making sure that all of you is aligned with him, he draws near. The relationship is, is, is popping. The relationship is, is good. And, and you're able to hear and see and recognize the things of God even more. So don't look at it as, man, this is just loving God is, is hard. Because it is. Dying daily is not fun. Dying is painful. There are certain things that we love that we have to learn to not love if we're going to live in alignment with, with God's expectation of us. So it's not a fun process, but as we continue to submit to it, as we continue to walk with him, he makes that thing work out for our good. 
we look up and, and we have peace in situations where we would have previously been depressed. We look up and we have healthy, thriving relationships, marriages, friendships, community. We look up and we're impactful. We're doing things that bring us joy and bring God glory. Hallelujah. And literally everything we do is impactful. Everything we do is fruitful. Everything we do prospers. That's the word of God. So I challenge you, me, to continue to pursue intentional love, not conditional, not just if you go to my church, not just, and I think church division is so stupid because we're one body. We should all desire that people be saved. I've left church here and gone to other churches afterwards before because I just love being in community with believers. If there's somebody creating kingdom content that I think is going to bless people, I send it over. Even if I'm creating the same type of content. You know why? Because the enemy has a whole portfolio of content. Movies, shows, film, internet articles, um, music, whatever. Like there's all types of stuff. And there are thousands of artists in each industry. So why can't there be the same thing for the church and we all promote all of it? As long as it aligns with the word of God. Because not everything aligns with the word of God. That's another topic. But kingdom, community, kingdom content, kingdom agenda, that should be everybody's goal to be advanced. And so as we pursue intentional love, family, like there's going to be opportunity for us to do it. And, and, and those opportunities are going to be challenging. But remember, we're not doing it on our own. It's not by our own ability. It's not by our might. It's not by our strength, but it's by his spirit. 